right hand of the Father. He is worthy and deserving of all our praise and worship. Amen? Amen. So as a church, man, what an honor it is that we get to gather. We get to glorify our King. And even more than that, he said, I had to go so that I can send the advocate to you. And we know that in this place, his presence is here. His Holy Spirit lives in us. And I'm just going to pray and ask that he would awaken our hearts this morning.
thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who have gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages. If you walk in freedom, and if you bear his name. 
recording every trespass, every sin, every condemnation against your children. You destroyed it, Lord. You destroyed it on the cross, Lord. And you resurrected, Lord. And we're, we died in your death. And we resurrected in you, Lord. We live resurrected lives in Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Help us to meditate on what's above, on the things above, and not the things on the world. In Jesus' name, Lord. And in, in Colossians, that's what it says. For, for you have died and you have a new life hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in the splendor of his glory. Amen. Thank you, Lord.
of my sin was dead. You knew I couldn't pay the debt. You paid it with your final breath. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. You took the wrath the eye. Your holy blood broke every curse. Your mercy had the final word. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing Christ and Christ crucified in
we pray, we pray, we pray to you, Jesus Christ. We pray, we praise you, we pray, yeah. yeah, we pray, we pray, we pray, our heart is full. Christ is risen indeed. He is risen. 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 risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. Thank you. Now this is truly a celebration day, is it not? Our Lord conquered death and he took the keys of Hades and he is conquered forever. We belong to him, and we belong in his presence, eternal life with him forever. Do I hear an amen? Amen. Amen. You guys, I don't know how to follow that. That's incredible. Well, welcome to all of you. Welcome. I'm hoping your Easter day is starting great. Those of you watching us um, uh, at home, God bless you. Have a great resurrection day. Now, we're just going to welcome, and I just have one thing to announce. It came up this morning, and that is Help for You's picnic got delayed because of rain. So it's going to be this coming Saturday, Palomares Park. And um, they had some Easter baskets donated. If you need Easter baskets, they're free on a table out there. Just a few of them, but for young kids and kids. Check them out on the way out, and if you still want to buy a raffle ticket this morning, Uh, Someone will be at the Help For You table for that. So with that said, we're going to take the offering. If the ushers could come forward. And let's pray. Father, you are so good to us. But Lord, we are just celebrating your victory over death. It's such a, uh, a wonderful thing. And it's the core of our message to the world. That Christ is indeed risen proving that you are God and you reign eternally and all lives must be reconciled to you by turning to you in faith. And Lord, we turn our hearts to you this morning and we look to you for everything because you are the victorious Savior. Bless this offering that we take this morning. Use these funds for your kingdom and bless Pastor Allen this morning as he comes and shares the word with us. In Jesus' name. Amen. So let me introduce our senior pastor, Alan Stretch, for the word today. Happy Easter. Good morning. All right, let's try it one more time. Uh, We'll do it in the Greek as well, because many of you have just, you woke up and you just had an itch. I need to say something in Greek today. Okay, so when, when, when I say, you know, he is risen, The response is, he is risen indeed. And this goes back centuries and centuries. Earlier Christians wouldn't say, hi, how are you? They would say, they would shake hands or they would hug and they would say, he is risen. And the person who didn't get it out first would say, he is risen indeed. So he is risen. risen Okay. He is risen. risen. Good. You caught on that. So now we're going to do it in the Greek. Okay. It's it's Christos Anesti. Christos Anesti. Okay, but I get to say that part. You get to say alathos anesti. Yep, I know, it's a little harder. Alathos anesti. Okay, got that? So I'm going to say the Christos anesti. Christos anesti. Alathos anesti. Christos anesti. Christos anesti. Christ has risen. Amen. Thank you guys for doing that. So, uh, you know, 
I had a, 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 a two wonderful daughters. One of them you saw up here. The other one is coming to our second service. But my second daughter, Leah, she, I, at a certain stage, I called my little skeptic, okay? Because when she would go to sleep, she would kind of delay having to really go to bed by asking questions. And so one night, I'm putting her to bed, and she goes, Dad, where is God? And I thought, wow, I'm a pastor. I've been studying. I've gone to seminary, reading the Bible. I've been preparing my whole life to answer this question for my daughter. And I leaned in, and I immediately prayed, and I got this image in my head. I go, that's a good way to describe it. And I said, you know, that tree in our front yard? Yes, Daddy. You know, all those little ants that you know, are kind of on a freeway? They're, they're climbing up that tree and going all over that tree? Yes, Dad. Well, that tree, compared to the ant, is so big that the ants can't picture the tree. You know, they, they just see the little bit in front of them. And I said, God is just so much bigger than that tree is to the ants. He's so big, we don't even realize we're in his presence because he's everywhere at all times. And I thought, wow, way to go. I patted myself on the back. Good pastor, good father, you know, really a great answer. And my daughter Leah just looked at me and she said, I don't see him. <laughs> well, one of our uh, kids in kids' place this week, or not this week, a while ago, uh, they, uh, you know, responded to a question. A teacher in our kids' ministry asked the question, what do you need to do before you come to God and ask for forgiveness? And I don't know exactly, but the teacher was probably looking for an answer like, well, you need to feel sorry or whatever. But the whole class was silent. Have you been in those situations where everybody's just silent? And finally, one little guy, he was really thinking about it hard, and he put up his hand, and the teacher said yes. And he said, before you ask God for forgiveness, you have to sin. And I just thought, <laughs> that's, that's true. That's a clever kid. And if that is your... Your son, you got to keep an eye on him, all right? <laughs> but, but I wanted to set up, you know, by telling you that story because there is something that you have to do before you really believe, before you really believe. And the claim that Christ is alive, that he's risen from the dead, that the stone was rolled away, that the grave clothes were emptied. And I love the account where it even says he folded up his grave clothes. Mother Mary would be so proud of Jesus, wouldn't he? she? You know, that he was laid in that tomb uh, by a rich man before sunset. That he had died on the cross. That he had said it is finished. That he had been horribly crucified, beaten. All those things are something that I believe in. At the from the bottom of my heart to the very top of my heart. Anyone else? But there's something that I had to do before I believed them, and that was doubt it. Okay? I remember a time when I wasn't like my daughter Leah. People would tell me things, and I would go, okay, I just believe. But when it came to Jesus, when people started telling me about Jesus, I'll be very honest, I had some concerns. I didn't understand everything, so I had a lot of questions. Is this resonating with anybody? And not only that, but I also had some doubts. You know, you, you have a relationship with a guy who lived 2,000 years ago who died in a horrific manner, and you're saying you've met him. Right, right, sure. I want to talk today about how important it is to have concerns questions and doubts. Be I understand that, that these things can be excuses not to seek God. But if you are seeking God, if you're seeking truth, if you're seeking love, if you're seeking purpose, if you're seeking fulfillment, and by the way, if you've tried making a life, it doesn't work. It never works. You can try and set yourself, I'm going to make a life for myself. I'm going to make a living. I'm going to make, no, 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 no. You cannot do that. It's a contradiction in terms. You can only find something and someone to give your life to. <laughs> That's what Jesus says. You know, if you try and keep your life, you're going to lose it. If you lose it for me in the gospel, you'll find it. But do you know that God knows us very well? Brilliant idea. Gold star, right? On my sheet. He knows us really well. 
And he knows all about our concerns. He actually understands that we have questions. And not only that, do you realize that not only does he accept people who doubt, but he welcomes them and walks with them, and he is totally secure the entire time. Because he is not only knows the truth, he is the truth. Okay? Now, so the picture that I want to paint today is an understanding of how willing God is to walk with people when they really want to walk with him in reality. And that God wants to blow by his Holy Spirit and wipe from his hand every sort of pretense and religious inclination just to kind of pretend that everything is, is completely fine and we understand everything. He wants us to be like little kids. And little kids are a lot more like my Leah. Skeptics at times, real honest. Come on, he's calling us into that. I want to read to you the first two verses of one of the last resurrection uh, accounts in the New Testament. It comes from Matthew 28, and we're going to look there. And I want you to see something maybe that some of you have never seen before in a resurrection account of Jesus. The disciples at this point, they had seen him in the upper room. They had seen him on the road. They had seen him, you know, by the lake. He had eaten with them several times in the room. But look what it says in Matthew 28, verse 16 and 17. It says, then the 11 went to Galilee, to the mountain that Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. Would you worship him? But check out what it says next. It says, but some doubted. What? Some doubted. Why did some doubt? I mean, I've been told seeing is believing. Have you been told that? But I've learned from myself, sometimes I see things and I still have trouble believing. Okay, is this an awkward Easter message? Are you okay? Okay. Some of you are looking at me like, where are the stones? I'm going to get him. But listen, all these 11 disciples, they saw and they heard about what had happened to Jesus. They knew about his arrest because they were there and they all ran away. They, you know, so Peter had followed and been there when he was put in prison and was being beaten, crowned with thorns, whipped till his back was torn open. John saw up close, but the, many of the rest of the disciples saw from far away because they were too afraid to get close to where Jesus was crucified. But they saw him with his wrists and his feet pierced. They saw him pulling himself up by his wrists and pushing up on the nail through his feet just so he could get another breath into his lungs. They saw him when his head slumped and the, dying, the sky darkened. And they also witnessed when that centurion pushed in the spear in his side and pulled it out. And there was a flow of both water and blood. We know exactly how Jesus died. He died of a broken heart. His heart burst, and the blood went into the sack around the heart. And because it was also filled with fluid, it, that it had separated, blood is thicker than water. And when the centurion pierced his side, it looked like two streams, one of blood, one of water, coming out from his side. They'd seen all that, and they knew what happens when people die. You know, people stay dead. But the women, you know, they saw him when they went, you know, on Sunday. That was Friday, but on Sunday, the women saw him in the garden tomb. They ran back to the disciples who doubted and didn't believe them. But they got up, a few of them, Peter and John, and ran to the tomb. And John being the, the, the only one of the two who wrote a gospel and also the younger man pointed out in his gospel, and I beat Peter because I'm faster than him, okay? <laughs> got there first. They encountered the risen Lord. He appeared in the upper room. He appeared on the road. He appeared by the lake. They saw Jesus risen from the dead over and over and over again. So how could anyone, after experiencing all of those things, still doubt? Well, we don't really know what they doubted. They might have still been going, I can't believe my eyes. That's a possibility. They might have doubted what this means. Like, okay, you're back. I've got a lot of things in my heart. I don't understand. It may have been that they 
doubted themselves. How am I worthy to stand here and be with the risen Messiah, the risen Savior? Doubt is indiscriminate. If you notice, doubt is an equal opportunity you know, worker. It will just go anywhere that it can land. But what I want to say to you is that, listen, you know, when it records that some doubted, that's important for us. Because it describes the God who is willing to walk with us, including in our doubts. Okay? So one of the reasons my wife married me, and it may be the only reason for all I know, but, but back in the day when, when, I, when I first met her, I was working for a church. And remember business cards, older people? Okay? Okay? Uh, it's, it's now like an ancient relic. But on my business card, after all my little information... I had at the bottom, question your doubts. Because I had had a kind of an understanding in prayer with the Lord when I was talking to him that he wanted me to talk to him really clear and clean. And, and I would talk to him and say, like, I believe, I believe you're there. But sometimes I question and I doubt that you hear me. And I realized, I felt a stirring that it was important to bring that to God. And the more that I brought my sincerity to God, Even when my sincerity, quote unquote, didn't look religiously clean, I encountered him. What do you know? He actually wants to encounter us in truth. And I came up with that little saying, my doubts are not the problem. My doubts can be like, you know, a bridge to go somewhere new with God. My doubts can actually be like Mario's little trampoline where he booms off into a new place. You know, my doubts can spring me to to places that if I don't question my doubts, I'll never get to. So, yes, they can be excuses, but they can also be a way that that God uses to elevate me closer to him. Amen. It's true. So these disciples, you know, they're the ones who wrote the book. And so why it's a curious thing that they included this, which is kind of a bad reflection on themselves. They've now seen the risen Lord many, many times, and here he is giving some of his final instructions to his friends, the the disciples, the apostles that he loves, and they're worshiping him, but still somehow, somewhere, mind, heart, body, soul, some doubt it. Huh. You know, that's just terrible advertising to put that in, in the Bible. You know, some doubt it. Can you imagine if we did advertisement in the vineyard like that? You know, we just got a big banner, you know, and put it outside, and we put Vineyard Church, some doubt. <laughs> and we had, like, we found out who the doubters were. Who's the doubter? Come on. Pull, you know, we got you, and we got a picture of you, and you were just like, like this, you know, I don't know, you know, and just put, put pictures out there of people. It would be weird advertising, wouldn't it be, for the church? But you understand, this is not trying to advertise. It's not marketing. It's not trying to convince you how to be somewhere that you're not. It's trying to tell the truth. You and I as human beings, we have concerns. We have questions. And yes, we encounter doubts. And our God embraces us, even though we might be sometimes full of those things. And he has so much faith. He has knowledge. He has assurance that that your doubts and your concerns and my questions cannot survive an encounter with the truth. Now, I got to say something else. If you notice, uh, maybe in your walk with the Lord, you'll have the same concern, question, doubt for a period of time. And there's some things that I would talk to the Lord over for a couple of years. I just ask him the same questions over and over. Why this? Why that? It's really important. Now, it's interesting. Because just because you have a doubt or you're asking a question doesn't mean, and I'll just speak to myself, that I'm ready to receive the truth and the answer. Okay? So in my belief that that period of asking those questions was also a preparation of my mind and my heart and my life to receive what he had to give me. But I had to go through that. You see, like I said, you can get so focused on your problem on your question, that you're not able to really offer it to God. But that process where you have to look at it and say, is this real? Do I really think this? Do I really feel this? Is this something I'm really struggling with? That is important. 
of course, the conclusion, when you're really able to start offering it to God and say, why, God? Why do wicked people around me prosper? Do you know that that is written about extensively in the Bible? Why wicked people seem to be having a good life and getting away with it, and their kids are, are healthy and happy? And, and, and that's in the Bible multiple times in the Psalms. It's in uh, Jeremiah. It's in Habakkuk. Why? Because these questions and concerns so, that some of us have are, have been, been asked for a very, very long time. But we can be so concerned and upset about it that we're not looking to him to provide what he has to give us. Which, by the way, can be expressed in two words, peace and freedom. Woo! Okay? So listen, how do you know that you're trying to encounter God instead of just grip onto your doubt? It's very, very simple. It's actually very, very easy. You see, when you are walking in true faith, but you still have those things, those concerns, questions, or doubts, when you're attempting to walk in obedience with God, then your doubts and concerns can be answered by him. But if you're not interested in obedience to God, then those things are probably going to be unresolved. And not only will you not hear the voice of God, it may not be because he's not speaking, but because you might have ears, but you're not listening to him. You know, sorry to say. But God is patient with us all along the way. So I want you to understand this. The, des the description in the Gospels of Jesus' closest followers are not of people who have everything figured and worked out. You know, it's a description of people that are just like me, maybe just like you. And Jesus didn't just walk with people who weren't sure what they believed or believed about him. He included them, embraced them, and brought them along. But they wanted to become, uh, to follow him, to learn his ways, to keep going, even though all these other things were in their heads or their hearts. You know, in the same way, there are others that have their own way, their own truths, their own decisions. They, you know, they're following different patterns maybe in the world. They're walking, they may say, oh, I, I'm trying to walk with Jesus, but they're walking in disobedience to that in order to embrace some cause, you know, some activity, some activism, whatever it might be. But they're pursuing that, and because that means that they cannot walk in obedience to God, then they're going to miss it, and their doubts will continue um, to be unaddressed in the way that he wants. Now, just to make a couple more points of how important doubts and questions are in our lives as followers of God and of Jesus Christ, I'm going to reference just a couple of the great giants of faith in the Bible. Have you really paid attention to the giants of faith and how they interact with God? Because, I mean, it's it's a bit comical at times. But how many of you know about Father Abraham? All right? Father Abraham, God speaks to him, and he believes he, he gets up from where he is. He moves to a foreign country just because God tells him to go. That's, that's amazing. But then God comes, and he tells him, hey, by the way, you are going to have a son. And Abram at this time is over 80 years old. And this is what it says in Genesis 17, 17. Abraham said, yes, Lord, I believe. You know, or if he didn't, he pretended, okay, I'll receive that. No, it says Abraham fell face down in awe, right? No, and he laughed and he said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? And will Sarah, that's his wife, bear a child at the age of 90? Well, we know men, they get messed up sometimes. So Sarah probably got it straight, right? You know, she had more faith, okay? In the next chapter, Genesis 18, verses 10 and following, it says, now Sarah was listening, and she heard the Lord say at this time, next year, I'm going to come back and return to you, and you're going to have a son. And so full of faith, Sarah just responds, praise the Lord. I've never doubted. I always believed. No, Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, um, which was behind him. And Abraham and Sarah were already very old. Sarah was past the age of childbearing, just a little bit. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out. <laughs> I love that description. <laughs> you know, worn out. <laughs> you know, and my husband, he's old. <laughs> Will I now have this pleasure 
Um, Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, well, I really have a child now that I am old. Is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer is no. But the problem is we don't always know it or understand it. God's not threatened by us. Okay. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. And Sarah was afraid, so she lied. Uh, Who's done that? And said, I didn't laugh. But the Lord, he said, yes, you did laugh. (laughs) Now, there are jokes that people don't get in the Bible. But this is one of the more plain ones. In keeping with this blessing, but also a very funny circumstance, Abraham and Sarah, who both laughed when they heard what God was going to do, named their their child, their son, Isaac, which means laughter. They kept it going. (laughs) They didn't let it up. (laughs) Now let's go on to one more. Moses. Anybody heard of Mo? Moses? All right. The great deliverer. God used him to deliver people out of their slavery in Egypt. The one, the great leader who led them through, the miracle worker, you know, ten plagues, the manna from heaven, the bread of the angels, the water from a barren rock, you know. God used him for all these things. The great lawgiver who spoke to God on top of Mount Sinai. Surely Moses never questioned or had any doubts. Not so much. Not so much. Moses began his relationship with the Lord by arguing with him. (laughs) How many of you think arguing with Almighty God is probably not a smart thing to do? (laughs) But it was where Moses was. And in Genesis 3 and 4, Moses went down that path. He had questions. The first one he said is, why would you choose me? You know? Then he gives the reason why God shouldn't choose him. He goes, I don't even know your name. I, I'm not, I don't know who you are. I don't know what kind of God you are or anything. Now, that should have disqualified him right off the bat, don't you think? I mean, should we just hire the next pastor who comes here like, oh, you don't know anything about Jesus? Come on in. You know, get up here and grab the mic. This is, this is crazy. We should not do that. But guess what? Nothing is impossible for the Lord. God can. All right? Doesn't know his name. And then finally, Moses gives his final argument. And he says this, I don't want to, I'm shy, and I'm a terrible public speaker. I can't talk to the people of Israel, and I certainly can't stand in front of Pharaoh because I can't get words out of my mouth without stuttering. And the Lord said, don't care. (laughs) Final thing, I love this, in Exodus 4, 13, Moses just pleads with the Lord. He, he, I, I just imagine him getting down on his knees, you know, in front of that burning bush and just saying, pardon your servant, Lord. Please don't send me. <laughs> How many of you would have probably done the similar thing? You see, I don't have time to detail the concerns, the questions uh, and doubts that are recorded in the Bible of so many of these giants of faith, the doubts that Gideon had. And Samuel had the questions that are proposed in the Psalms, in the prophets, like in Jeremiah and Habakkuk. Boy, could they raise their concerns to God, those those two prophets in particular. Or how many different times the disciples didn't know what was going on, asked the wrong questions, and, and were led to the wrong conclusions. Why would God persist to be with people like that? The truth of the matter is, he understands Those places of doubt, those places of questions, when turned really to him and not held on to as an excuse for disobedience, when they're really given to him, they will elevate us to a completely different place in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I'm telling you, Jesus believed in this. I'm going to read the passage as we move toward the end of this message again from Matthew 28, starting in verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee up to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So obviously we're not going to give the doubters anything important to do. They need to go to school, maybe read some books, you know, hear some apologetic lectures on YouTube or something like that. But that's not what Jesus did. 
everybody, the ones from the one who was most worshiping to the one who had the most doubts, he looked at these 11 and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples. How many? Like one or two? Is that fine, Lord? No, I'm giving you the assignment to make disciples of all nations. Uh, it, the real word is ethnos. It's, it's cultures, all, people of all different cultures. Okay? Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He gave this assignment to some who held doubts, possibly even that he was really alive. They were having trouble believing their eyes. Why? Because he's the Lord, and he knows all. He's outside of time and space. He was with them before their creation when they were just a thought in his mind. He was with them when they were being born. He was with them standing on that mountain, but he's the Lord, the glorified Lord. And so he also was with them as they were faithfully exercising their assignments in obedient and also being elevated out of their doubts. And he was with them when they suffered for his name. And most of them died, you know, with the witness. Go ahead and put me to death. My Lord has risen from the dead. <laughs> What you're going to take from me, you're not going to keep because I belong to him. All right? And he is with them throughout all eternity. That is the mind of God and the way he works all the time. Do you understand why we have total and complete freedom to come to him and be who we are in our minds, in our hearts, in our soul, and in our strength? The command, the greatest command that we are called to fulfill is this. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, and all of your strength. And he knows what he's talking about when he asks me to do that. Because when my strength is low, I love him with the strength that I have. When my mind is clear, awesome. I love him with that. But when it's clouded or confused, I come and I love my God with my mind. When my spirit feels like it's been scrambled up and I got hit somewhere, not in my body, but it still hurts, I come to him and I can love him even with a contrite heart and a broken spirit. He understands and he accepts us and wants us all. And our healing is always in coming to him. <laughs> and that means coming with what's real. The commandment to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength is reality. If you seek to love anything less than him first, you're going to lose, you know, your, your ability to love those things. And some of them, by the way, don't deserve love at all, okay? But if you love him first, all these other things will be given to you as well. Amen. They'll get ordered out. He's the perfect place to put all of our hearts, all of our minds, all of our souls in whatever state we find them in. Whew. Thank you, Lord. So last thing I just want to say is this. The Lord knows. He knows my position. He knows you. He, he's seen when you faked it and you pulled it off with everybody except him. Okay? Okay? And he didn't turn away from you. Okay? But he is only really interested, and it's the only work that he's going to do, is to bring him us to himself, you know, through the doubts. We talk like this, oh, all these problems, all these concerns I have in my life. Oh, my gosh, I've got all these questions swirling. God, why would you let this happen to me? Why would this happen to you? All, all these things. Oh. I heard someone say something, and it just brought this doubt in my head. These doubts are testing my faith. That's what we say, okay? But that's not true. In obedient uh, faith, they exist in me to test my concerns, my questions, and my doubts. I don't know if you got that. We say that these issues that are going on in my heart and my head that are coming from the inside, they're there to, to test my faith. That is not true. 
my obedient faith in Jesus tests my concerns, tests my questions, and tests my doubts. And by the way, when any of those are not in line with the truth, my obedient faith in following Jesus Christ crushes my doubts. It takes away the concerns and the sting of them and answers my questions. Hallelujah, glory. Okay, I got a look from several of you, like, um, like you may not still get this, but I'm telling you the truth. God uses these things in our lives in a way that we don't talk about them. Um, l- let me tell you two examples as I close. First one was this. You know, I had an encounter with God when I was 17 years old, and I walked away going, either I'm losing my mind or I have encountered the God who loves me more than I've ever experienced love. I don't think there's any other way to experience that kind of love. And by the way, he called me to account. He is not lowering his standards. Like, I got that real clear from my encounter with him. He loves me, and he doesn't want to leave me where I'm at. He wants to take me somewhere else. Okay, clear, all right? But then immediately, I had all kinds of different things that were in my life. But finally, I understood that I had a clear channel. So I remember there was a, a, a girl who was a part of a cult in my school. And she came to me as a brand new believer in Jesus. And she said, you know, my dad wants to talk to you. They, they wanted to recruit me into the cult. Yay. Okay. The way you know <laughs> you're in a cult is when they want real bad to get you in, but you can't leave. And if you do leave, no one will ever talk to you. If someone has trouble and they wander away from Christ, are we going to love them? Yes. No shunning, right? Okay. So just to be clear, you know, I went into that meeting and I was praying like crazy. And when I got there, this guy started, you know, saying this about the Bible. But I was a brand new believer and my mind was fresh and clean. And I had been reading the Bible, you know, very, very fast. And as a 17-year-old kid, I was able to answer this guy who was in his 50s over something that supposedly he'd been studying his whole life. And I walked away from that going, that was weird, Lord. He just asked me a question about something that I just read this morning. And I said, you know what? I love walking with you, and I love walking with you in truth. It was so great. But then I had another encounter. I had been messing around with the occult. You would call it New Age or witchcraft nowadays, but it was called the occult when I didn't have a beard or gray. And I had some very weird spiritual things that were happening. When I went to sleep in my dreams, And the interesting thing was, when I brought it to the Lord, it was very clear, these spiritual attacks, these disturbing things that were happening, these things that scared me were not there to test my faith, but to prove that my faith in him was right, good, and true. Does that make sense? I stood up in that attitude, and I said, I will not be drawn to focus on the enemy. And so what I did when something scary or disturbing would happen, I would get up and thank God that he was bigger than any spiritual attack, any devil or demon that was coming against me. I'm going to say it one more time. These things that are happening to us are not tests of our faith. Our obedient faith to Jesus are there to test those concerns and crises. Amen. Would you mind standing up? I'm going to do Holy Spirit, we love you. I love your work and your people. Okay, Lord, I stirred the pot. You've got to perspect it, Lord. You've got to make it so that it really is nourishing. So first of all, I just want to ask you, you know, are you at the place where you're willing to not just have your issue, but to try and obediently submit it to the Lord. I understand I'm a pastor. People think pastors have less issues. We have more issues. It's just more obvious when we don't submit them to the Lord. And it comes out in scandal usually. Okay? But I've got to ask you, are you ready? Are you ready to start putting those things in front of the Lord? And if that's you, then I'm just going to ask that you pray with me. 
just say this, either quietly or even inside. Say, God, I am ready to come and encounter you in your truth. I will walk like your disciples, like your closest friends and the giants of faith. I will speak to you directly of the concerns of my mind and my heart. I will no longer hold on to these things to keep me from being with you. Now listen, a lot of times we tell people, try and put things down. But in this case, nope. I'm asking you to lift it up. So if you have something really clear, maybe it's a hurt that's happened to you in the past. Maybe it's, you know, your own bad behavior, sinful behavior. Why did I do that? Maybe it's uh, you're an intellectual or you think you are, like I think I am, okay? You know, <laughs> but maybe you have something that's just not resolved. I'm telling you, you're totally normal. But would you lift that up to the Lord? God, this is my question. This is my concern. This is my doubt. Why did some doubt? Why did some doubt? because they were dealing in real relationship with God. Final thing, if you have had kind of a weird religious culty spirit where you're just going to, you know, pretend that everything is resolved in your life and you want to leave that in order to clearly and cleanly walk with God while he puts it all together for us, if you want to leave that religious spirit and stop pretending, just tell him, Lord, I'm ready to be real with you in ways that I haven't before. In Jesus' name. Now, don't move too quick. Last thing I want to say, if you're here and you are ready to open up and fully surrender and really say, I desire to follow you with all of my heart, I'm ready to repent, which means turn away from your own life and come into the life that you receive with God to stop doing things singly and come into a relationship with God where now it's more than one of you and it's clear who the leader. It's not me, it's him. It's not you, it's him. You're ready to give the life that you have made up and give your life to him who made it. And if that's you, in just a minute, I'm going to just ask that you respond. But if we can have all heads bowed, all eyes closed. If you're here and you want to do that, would you just lift your hand and say, I want to surrender my life. I want to give it to the Lord. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. God bless you. Okay. God bless you. He loves you. So now we're going to do something different. Usually we ask you to pray. And I'm, I'm going to say, just pray your honest, sincere prayer to the Lord. But can we pray for those who raise their hands and say they want to fully surrender? Will you do it with me? Okay. God's such a great listener. He can listen to more than one person at a time. Can you imagine if we gave everybody a microphone and everybody tried to preach an Easter message? It would be chaos. But to God, he can sort it all out. Would you pray with me and just pray for those who are surrendering? Let's just pray our best prayer. Father, we thank you, God, for hearts and minds opened and surrendered to you. We bless you. Come on, I feel like I'm the only one. Let's do your own words. We, Lord, I pray and I thank you, God, for everything that you have made in them. Now recreate them in Christ, God. Thank you that as they trust you and confess their sins, they're wiped completely clean because you've already paid the full debt, Lord. Give them an understanding that they can freely and boldly talk to you at all times because you are so able to be there for us in absolutely everything. And fill them with the power of your Holy Spirit, God, that there would be things that had chained them up for years, thick steel chains that will now be completely broken off and they will walk in freedom. And most of all, Lord, we thank you, God, that you are going to lighten the load. Woo! Who wants a light load? Okay? You're going to lighten the load because you say, if you're tired and weary, come to me because my load is easy and light. Thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Christos Anesti. Okay, that's pretty good. Alothosinesti. Christos Anesti. Christos Anesti.
Jesus Christ, my Savior, Messiah, is he yours, has risen, he has risen indeed. Have a wonderful Sunday. Every good thing that's around us, including the people, have been given to us by our Creator God. Go and enjoy them. <laughs> Go and have a great time. Have a wonderful, wonderful Resurrection Sunday. The Lord loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it except living it. Thank <laughs> you.